Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. High throughput screening robotics within the UK Center for Drug Discovery. Presented by Mark Wigglesworth, Director High Throughput Screening, AstraZeneca. I am Kaylee Bach of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type your questions, and hit send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Mark Wigglesworth. I'll now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Kaylee, and uh, thank you, Labroots, for the invitation to come and uh, speak uh, today. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, high throughput screening uh, infrastructure, the uh, collaborations um, that we've put together to support that infrastructure, um, and uh, the innovations that we've made uh, along the way uh, through those collaborations. And uh, at, at the very end of the presentation, I'll also take you through um, reliability, why that's important to us, and uh, how we're going to uh, support this screening infrastructure um, moving forward. So the UK Centre for Lead Discovery um, is a centre created by AstraZeneca. It's been created, uh, at least in part, uh, because of an opportunity to move our um, research and development facility within the UK. Um, the facility uh, classically was uh, near Manchester for AstraZeneca, uh, and this will relocate to a new building uh, near Cambridge. And uh, with that, we've had an opportunity to look at uh, the entire uh, supporting infrastructure across compound management and screening and really redesign that in the best possible way. Um, as we've been doing that, we've also been thinking about um, the, the ways in which we can work. And the UK Centre is really about um, develop, de developing a new approaches to high throughput screening, new approaches of finding molecules uh, that ultimately um, will uh, help patients. And we're doing this by collaborating with groups like the Medical Research Council and Cancer Research UK. And what will be happening in this new building is that their people uh, will be working alongside AstraZeneca's people running their own projects. And uh, they'll be free to take their projects um, outside of the building and continue to work on them within their own infrastructure. And uh, uh, the only thing that we ask in return is that if there's something uh, that does become um, uh, potentially a, a medicine uh, that they come back to us and we have a first right to to offer them a market rate uh, on, uh, on on their discovery so really quite a different way of working uh, and and quite a different way of um, uh, uh, running the science within the facility and this isn't uh, the only way in which we're changing, the only way in which we're, we're looking to drive new collaborations. And um, this slide uh, shows just a, a few of the collaborations that we've put in place in AstraZeneca uh, over the last few years, uh, more than 100, uh, covering many different areas. But, but it represents uh, a really, really little uh, drive to embrace what's outside of AstraZeneca, to work with other companies and create shared value. Um, our Open Innovation website also reflects this. Uh, on this website, you can go on and gain access to our cl clinical compound collection, uh, perhaps for repurposing. Uh, you can nominate uh, new chemistry that uh, you might have within your establishment uh, to come into our screening collection. Uh, and you can uh, actually nominate projects as well, targets that you want to bring either to screen with us uh, in, in the UK Centre, 
um, or uh, targets for which you, you would like to access uh, diversity collections uh, to screen uh, externally. And, and these external collaborations are um, a, a, an important part of our open innovation offering. Um, slide here uh, shows, uh, or, or gives you some feeling um, for, for uh, how this is um, distributed across the globe. And, and we now have uh, over 79 um, projects in this portfolio where we've shared uh, compounds for, for people to advance their own projects. And the input from AstraZeneca isn't just about sending in those compounds, it's also about um, guidance on assay development, uh, screening cascades, uh, workup on uh, computational computational chemistry and data analysis so that the right compounds can be found uh, and hopefully that will uh, lead to a successful uh, project completion. And if we turn our attention back to um, the UK centre, um, here uh, we're screening those collaborative projects. Um, if we go back to 2014, uh, we, we haven't run an open innovation screen of this type at all. Um, only in recent years uh, have, have we started to see a growth in, in this portfolio uh, with actually a projected growth out to 2020 of 20 screens within this portfolio. It's really quite an astonishing uh, rate of, of growth over, over five years. And this has been driven, there's been, been a, a lot of uh, forework to this, of course. It's been driven by the open innovation portfolio that uh, I, sh I shared or the website that I shared a few slides ago. Um, the uh, global academic community being able to propose projects into this portfolio, but also those strategic collaborations I talked talked about with the Medical Research Council and Cancer Research UK. And all of these came online through 2015 and 16. We're now also seeing an opportunity to work uh, with other groups in, in a different way. Um, we've uh, recently announced a collaboration with Charles River. Now here, um, Charles River will be able to bring uh, their own customers' uh, projects into the UK centre and they'll be able to screen uh, their customers' projects on our infrastructure in a shared uh, cost model. Uh, again, uh, bringing benefit to, to both organizations in the infrastructure that we will have created. So it's a, it's a really strong portfolio and a great opportunity for all of these uh, academic groups and uh, other organizations to, to access. And uh, the next slide here on uh, slide eight is a uh, photograph of one of the robotic systems, um, but we'll also be able to move to a video of this facility. And uh, just in, in a moment, uh, we'll play you a, a video so, so you can see really what, what is on offer. And can we play that video? AstraZeneca are entering a new era in drug discovery by unveiling the world's most advanced drug discovery robot. We decided to take the very best of all our learning from the past two decades and say, if we had a blank sheet of paper, how would we do this? Rather than have to change the science so as it would fit with the robot, it was really important for us with these new robots that they should work for the science. Nicola B is up to three times faster than our previous robots and can test millions of potential compounds against the diseases we're trying to address. Acoustic delivery technology, when combined with Nicola B, will allow us to work in a way which is not only more efficient, but more sophisticated. Unlike other robots, Nicola B can work safely next to our scientists and even be controlled remotely via a tablet. This gives us a better chance than ever of finding suitable compounds which can progress into potential life-changing medicines of the future. AstraZeneca's Open Innovation Program is transforming the model through which industry is working with academia by giving research partners access to our laboratories, our compound library and to our robots. It's really exciting that AstraZeneca are opening their doors and letting scientists from academic organisations into their labs. It will have a real positive impact on our work, something which would previously have taken a year to do and now we'll be able to do in a few months. Partnerships allow us to work with real-world leaders in specific areas, sharing scientific knowledge, process knowledge and technical knowledge for the benefit of all parties. 
This will enable us to push the boundaries of science and deliver more life-changing medicines than ever before. Okay, brilliant. I hope um, the video uh, gives you a sense of the types of robotics, the scale and the way that we're working uh, in that facility. Um, and I'm also going to go on and, and uh, tell you an awful lot more about what we've got here. Um, this, this slide um, uh, gives, gives you a sense of, of how many different groups we've had to work with to, to create this infrastructure. Um, I'm going to tell you first and foremost most about uh, collaboration with HiRes, about collaborations with some of the other groups that are on this slide. Um, but you may also have seen uh, presentations on other collaborations uh, between LabSite and Waters to create an acoustic MIS uh, mass spectrometry platform for screening, uh, or between uh, LabSite and Brooks in creation of an acoustic tube project for compound management. Uh, again, here to, to accelerate uh, project management, uh, uh, sorry, compound management workflows uh, and the efficiency of, of storage and dispense. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of those today, but as, as I've already said, if uh, you do look online, you may well be able to find those as well. They do form part of the UK centers infrastructure. So first off, the uh, collaboration with HiRes. And here we wanted to build a different type of screening automation. We'd had experience of working uh, with HiRes and with uh, Agilent uh, Biocells over recent years. And we liked the way that these fully automated systems were able to build some quite complex uh, assay systems. But all of these uh, screening robotics uh, are enclosed, and it really limited uh, how we could use the equipment within them. Um, historically, um, fully automated systems were a perhaps a little bit more open, but um, were, were more limited in their construction and what they could deliver. And whereas we liked the uh, flexibility and ease of use of the smaller robotic systems on the bottom of the slide, you know, the modular uh, dispense systems, they, they don't offer, offer the complexity of screen that, that we need um, with high throughput screening. And so we decided to work with um, high-res biosolutions, and we decided to work with them because we liked their uh, mobile cart system and their microdot system, which uh, for us, we felt provided a, a leading um, uh, automation platform for, for high-throughput screening. But we didn't really like the way uh, once the cart was uh, undocked, it was difficult to use, or, or actually if it was um, uh, docked onto a system, sometimes it was, it was difficult to access. Um, you could improve the, the throughput uh, if your reader happened to have a stacker on it, um, but quite often we put equipment onto these systems and, and then not be able to use them for other things. And so that quickly moved us to the concept of a mobile cart that had its own robotics. And the design on this slide uh, shows the uh, precise robot arm on a cart system. And uh, here, even when undocked, we're able to move plates round from stackers to, to what is on here, a dispense cart, to make additions of different types from different dispensers. And it gave us a, a, a high density platform where we could put lots of different dispensers or readers or other things onto. Um, and this was important, again, for our transition into a new building with uh, limited space. Um, and it also created a, a common automation capability. And we're able to uh, iterate on these uh, cart systems. We'll show you that in, in a slide or two's time. But if you take a, a closer look at what we've done on these carts, uh, you can see, and uh, you might have got a sense in the video as well, that these are really open. Uh, the photograph on the left-hand side shows uh, access to the um, 
dispensers, uh, as well as the, the robot arm to the bottom right and uh, the stacking system in the middle. There's a centrifuge uh, underneath that stacking system as well. All of this equipment is accessible. It's easily accessible to the user um, just to observe and do uh, manual uh, quality control. Um, and it's easily accessible if you just wanted to come up to this system to to run one or two plates uh, rather than running it on a, a fully automated um, uh, platform. Some of the things that we've done with these carts uh, to improve their functionality as well with the, with the dispensers is introduce uh, multi-port valves. These permit us to run uh, our assay reagents through the dispensers and then switch to cleaning reagents uh, unattended, and this can be programmed. Uh, and uh, we have uh, gravity drains from these dispensers that plug into the, into the floor, uh, allowing us to take our waste away efficiently. Uh, on the bottom right, we can see um, ducts that uh, sit over the equipment. This allows, allows us to connect to air vents to remove any um, potentially noxious uh, gases and make additions for um, key cell uh, reagents or, or, or reagents key in cell assays, such as formaldehyde. If we look more broadly at the types of carts that um, we have uh, in, in our laboratories today, and uh, we have everything from the dispense cart that we've had a closer look at um, through to uh, acoustic transfer carts uh, shown uh, again in the middle of the slide, uh, a contact pipetta, today it's a V-prep, but will soon become uh, high res's uh, prime system. As well as our uh, reader systems, we, we have our BMG FSX um, multi-mode uh, reader as our main workhorse within uh, the high throughput screening uh, laboratory. But we also have um, more complicated reader systems for uh, cell imaging, the cell insight shown there bottom right, uh, transcriptomics capability, and uh, the introduction of label three technologies like the Corning Epic. Um, all of this enables us to build uh, quite a complex um, uh, portfolio of different assays. And once we've got this um, cart system uh, up and running, we're able then to um, connect cart systems to each other. And you can connect, for example, a dispense cart with your multi-mode reader and build very simple biochemical assays. Uh, we can introduce uh, Lyconic uh, cart systems uh, for storage of plates, where we might do a dispense, store, uh, a cell plate before moving it onto our um, cell imaging uh, system. And, and there we can start to bring in more complicated assay systems. But we can't run everything uh, through these CART systems. We have to also have more complicated uh, robotic systems. And here we had to start to look at evolving the uh, MicroStar platform that HiRes had. Um, we focused on the uh, carts, as I've described, but then how to bring them together to fully automate them and, and be able to pass carts between all of those different, um, pass plates, sorry, between all of those different um, flavors of, of carts. And we uh, decided to do this using the uh, KUKA. Um, it's a collaborative robot. Uh, on the center of this automation platform. And, and uh, its collaborative ability means uh, that it can sense uh, the environment around it. It can sense pressures if there was a user in the environment and force feedback. Uh, so unlike the uh, historic robots that you, you might have seen on the television in uh, automation factories, um, these robots can be used safely next to um, our scientists. And um, providing they're not run at full speed. Okay? So we had to bridge a gap between wanting to run these robots at full speed and wanting to run them in their maximum sensitivity mode. And what we were able to do there is introduce a laser scanning technology to that central robot 
that uh, platform and you can see uh, zones in red, orange and green um, that are sensor zones from these uh, lasers. If somebody enters those regions, it begins to slow down or if it appears in the, the red zone, it can have an automatic stop, uh, guaranteeing safety of our, of our scientists. And even if um, we remove carts, uh, you can see on the far right, um, that zone automatically fills in so that the carts can be taken away and used for the purposes while this robot system can, can continue to operate. Um, and, and really with, with these uh, alterations and the, and the design of uh, the, the MicroStar together with the, the CART systems, we had quite a, a, a flexible portfolio of hardware and um, being able to run fully automated individual CARTs or combination of CARTs. But we, we still felt that there was some uh, way uh, to go in terms of the user interaction with these uh, and uh, the, the ability to, to program and uh, use these. Uh, we like the simplicity and user interface that we've seen historically with some of the more uh, simple uh, automation systems. And IRIS have their um, scheduling software, Solario, and uh, again, we worked um, in, in, in in quite a detailed way with IRES to start to design Solario in a slightly different way so, so that it became uh, more simple for users to, 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 to interact with. And uh, first was alterations to version 3.2, uh, where uh, HiRes introduced a scripting language uh, for Solario. And it's, this starts to allow the program to make uh, decisions uh, about uh, protocol behavior and starts to allow us to bring scripting into to iconize specific tasks so that they can be grouped um, and means that users can use the software uh, without needing to understand uh, how to code um, uh, scripting, the, the, the um, detailed scripting language. We would also change the software so that it can handle lids and plates as separate resources, permitting them to be uh, separated while they're on the robot system, uh, an addition to be made to the plate, for example, and then the lid returned to it, and the software can track all of those movements, uh, improving the workflows. We've introduced um, plate processing flow gates, so plates can be told to be held in certain areas uh, if there's an issue uh, with with um, processing upstream or downstream of, uh, um, of, of that point. And uh, we've also introduced uh, with uh, this version uh, the ability to run uh, error recovery, error recovery stri uh, uh, scripts um, instead of having to restart the protocols completely or, or run the risk of, of losing your run or the entirety of your run. You can run these error, error recovery processes and um, skipping and wait wanted plates out of uh, your protocol and allowing the robot system to continue. And uh, in the next version of Solario, here we're anticipating some further simplification of uh, protocol design uh, to allow uh, multiple threads um, to be defined. Again, that uh, simplifies the way that the user can interact with them. Uh, they're going to be able to be compressed and grouped into cartridges. Again, these cartridges can be uh, easily copied and pasted controls, uh, simplifying that um, programming for a user. And then enabling the user to shrink as a super user, an engineer, or, or somebody who's just wanting to run their, their protocol on a daily basis. The software is now smart. It, it, it like a, a smart motorway. It's able to control the um, flow of plates around the system, uh, and they can be stored for a few seconds if they need to be in order to let the traffic move out of the way uh, be, before moving on to a specific dispenser or reader. And, and protocols and system equipment uh, resources can be viewed differently with filters as well. So if there's a problem with a specific um, reader um, or dispenser, again, you can easily filter that within the software and find out what the problem is. 
what does this mean for us? What do these changes mean for us? Well, in a scenario 3.2, the use of the scripting language enables us to automate the uh, QC of our dispensers, and in this case, it's the Certus. Um, now, phase one of this, and we can do this now, is that we can run an automatic QC of the Certus valves uh, using gravimetric tests um, and collect that data. That data can then be manually uploaded into the Certus software to make the relevant adjustments. As we move forwards, that data will be automatically imported uh, into uh, the Certus software so that a user doesn't have to, to make that adjustment. And uh, the, the plans longer term is that um, this will be able to, done, to be done within a run to monitor performance. And those adjustments will be able to be made automatically, um, flagging um, plates or parts of runs that have issues so that they can be uh, removed. In the next version of our software, Solario 3.3, um, the interconnection of um, the uh, robot system with gene data, which is our um, database for analyzing uh, our screening uh, data. Um, this uh, will allow us to run pharmacological QC live through a run and have that automatically analyzed. Uh, additionally, we'll be able to do things like uh, run um, imaging plates uh, with a, a quick pass image, uh, pick out wells that are of interest and go back and do a full image analysis, giving us the, the high quality images that we need and the throughput that's associated with high throughput screening. And next, I want to go back to um, some of the uh, collaborations that, that we've had in place outside of these large uh, pieces of, of infrastructure. And I want to talk to you about the uh, collaboration with Geiger in Switzerland and their Certus device. Um, if we go back to 2015, AstraZeneca ran a, an evaluation um, of uh, a number of different dispensers. And at the time, the, the Certus was selected as the dispenser that best fitted our needs across um, the assay development and screening groups within our central service organization. Um, it's a dispenser that very capably dispenses uh, a, a wide range of volumes from 50 nanoliter to 5 mils. You can do that in 384 and 1536 well plates very capably. Uh, and it uses a, a micro valve technology uh, to enable this. However, for, for high throughput screening, there were still some limitations on, on the throughput this device. And so we've worked with Geiger uh, to implement some changes that have really helped us. And some of these are really simple changes, and, and I'll explain them as we, as we move through. Um, but they can make quite big differences to, to what you can achieve within a high throughput screening environment. And the first one is the creation of an angled dispense head for, for this um, uh, device. And if you look at the photograph of the wells in the, the top middle of the slide, uh, you can see uh, in pen written on the plate, this is the different angles that were trialed. And at the bottom of that image, we've got zero. And as you look across the, the two rows of um, uh, wells and dispensers that have been made, you can quite clearly see lots of air bubbles within those wells. Those air bubbles, um, if left as they are, um, can really affect the quality of your assay. So the table um, underneath that uh, image, uh, row five and six, the red text, shows uh, the CV for, for a biochemical assay where we've not centrifuged. And clearly that CV is not acceptable for the quality that, that we need to reach uh, within a, a screening organization. So you have to spin these plates, that's row seven and eight on that table, to reach uh, an acceptable uh, uh, CV and quality, uh, but that takes time. 
Okay, so what we've done by introducing the angled head, and you can see this in, in the photograph where we started, uh, by introducing the angled head, you remove the air bubbles. Uh, and again, on the table, we can see that in rows uh, one to two without centrifugation, we still reach a, uh, an acceptable CV. Um, as we would if we span those plates. Um, but this time we're doing it with, with quite a significant time saving. The other added benefit for this um, system is that um, instead of dispensing reagent directly into the well, if you're running a cell assay, where that can uh, displace cells and uh, affect the quality. Um, here you can dispense down the side of the well and, and run a lower risk of dislodging those cells uh, again delivering a higher quality to um, the, the screening assays. In addition to this, um, when we first started using um, the CERTIS system, it was actually quite difficult um, to uh, use uh, uh, multiple valves uh, across uh, the, the dispenser. And uh, it had a, a four valve uh, dispense head. And uh, we've worked with um, Geiger um, to fully understand how we balance these, how we calibrate them, and there's some improvements in the software now, which, which greatly improved that. On the left-hand side, uh, the top plate there shows uh, the types of issues that you see. If this is, isn't done properly, the top, um, I think it's eight rows, dispensed with um, a uh, 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 one valve, uh, and clearly that valve is very different to, to the rest of the valves on, on the plate, uh, which, which causes then a, uh, an issue with, with the data quality. If you balance that, you can reduce the CVs to 4% to below and improve the quality. Uh, and as you would expect, um, using um, four valves uh, as opposed to one valve um, doesn't affect the pharmacology, and uh, that could be seen on the far right, yet it is significantly quicker. And further improvements are, are planned in this space. Uh, Geiger have now also developed an eight-channel head, uh, which we're expecting to get hold of in the, in the near term to, to fully validate as well. Um, but all of these things make a big difference to high throughput screening and what you can do. And, and in the meantime, as well as um, looking forward to that eight-channel head, we've also been working with Geiger to develop their software to allow us to uh, run uh, the, the four channels in parallel to make two different uh, liquid dispensers. And classically, the only way to do this would have been to make a, a single dispense with four valves and then uh, move that plate, physically move it to another dispenser and run another dispense. That, that would take around 50 seconds per dispense. Uh, with this new system, with the changes in the software, we can make both additions uh, to, the, to the single assay plate in just over a minute, effectively halving the time and again maintaining the quality of signal, as, as you can see on the right-hand side. Now, um, the final piece of um, innovation around these dispensers has been um, actually in creating smart drains. I told you previously that we had these sisted into the laboratory floor so that we can drain waste and excuse me, work effectively at the weekends uh, by running these systems uh, unattended. Um, now we can be absolutely sure that the system won't create um, uh, waste, a uh, solution waste, um, when when the system isn't connected, and this is simply done with an RF um, ID tag uh, and connector, so that um, that um, signal is only made when that uh, device is plugged in, and the software within the automation will only let these um, dispensers function and generate waste when that connection is made. Really simple uh, innovation, uh, but gives us high confidence then that we can run these systems unattended over the weekend without any concern of, of um, waste bottles overflowing or um, waste uh, uh, being allowed to escape into the laboratory. And uh, finally, in terms of the collaborations and, and innovation, I want to talk to you about uh, a collaboration that we've been running with Ironfield Systems. Um, now, Ironfield Systems have a device called the uh, Plasma Knife, uh, and this consists of a centrifugal plate washer, a plasma source, 
a control module and a series of, of wash and waste bottles. They're not shown in the in the photograph, but I do mention them because they do form um, quite a significant part of this in terms of um, the physical size of, of the um, uh, to total uh, equipment. Now, um, w working with a system to clean plates, um, of course, sounds like a, an excellent idea um, because of the potential impact on the, the cost of screening and reduction in, in plate use, um, but also because of the environmental impact as well, if we can reduce the, the plastic waste that's generated. And AstraZeneca entered into a collaboration with Ironfield Systems in their beta test program back in 2016. And, and we've done a lot of work with them uh, uh, over that time period to establish um, really excellent cleaning protocols and reliability of, of this system. And um, we've also now been working with uh, NCATS, uh, who had a separate collaboration with, with Ironfield Systems, and, and we're now able to share experiences and maximize the benefit of this. But um, simply, um, what we're doing here is taking our dirty um, assay plates or used plates, um, putting them into the centrifugal washer um, that uh, rinses the plates, uh, spins them to remove all of the, the, the waste from them, and washes them with a, a water and ethanol mix before passing them on to um, the plasma knife system. And this generates um, plasma from uh, high voltage electronic fields. And this, this uh, instantly ionizes uh, any organic matter that's left on the plates and uh, vaporizes it so that it's safely removed uh, from, from the surface of the plate. And some of the things that we've um, worked with Ironfield Systems on uh, actually cover um, all of the three pieces of, of uh, equipment that we talked about on the first slide. Um, from the rinse module, uh, it's about the components in there, ensuring that they're made of a hydro hydrophobic material uh, to reduce the wetness and durability of, of that system. Um, introducing uh, changes in protocol to, to allow pre-spin, emptying wells before we, we start the process, uh, adding a solvent, uh, micro dispense, small amount of solvent to ensure that we've um, dissolved uh, anything which is, is stuck on that plate that we don't want before we start. And again, um, looking at how we can make this um, uh, device as green as possible. So shortening rinse times and reducing waste volumes uh, by doing so. For the plasma module here, um, through, through the uh, beta test program, um, the, the uh, controller itself was changed, uh, and that resulted in um, more focused plasma uh, being um, made, uh, uh, which was a, a higher intensity within the microtiter plate, um, but with a lower um, heat uh, generation, so uh, potentially uh, safer uh, to use within within the equipment as well. Um, and inclusion of a rinse step after the plasma treatment has also uh, been found to be crucial for the assays. Um, ionization of uh, the biological um, material within the plates could result in uh, ions left within the plate that, that affected uh, pH. So that rinse step is uh, critical if your assay it can be affected by the by pH. Again, we've worked with Iron Field on generating uh, user-friendly software, and we're continuing to work with them and now HiRes to integrate this software uh, into our automation setup. And uh, the, the next slide that I've got here is an example of uh, the, the, the types of things that uh, we saw initially. And this is um, a uh, biochemical absorbance assay. It's 1536 well plate. And, and on the plates, we've got um, dose response curves. And if you look, um, perhaps in the, the first plate, top left-hand corner, you can see the, the blue colors are running down the plate. Um, that is a, a single dose response curve. And then they're positioned in a snake-like manner all the way around uh, that plate. Um, and these are, these are compounds that had a known pharmacology at the target. Um, that, that's under test here. So um, it's not a, a, a random screening plate. It, it, it is um, 
a known pharmacology. And what we found initially when we, we ran the first protocol that we had is that when we retested that same plate in the assay, so we've not added any compound, we've just taken that plate and rerun the assay, um, the, the plate in the middle is data um, from, from that, and we could still see some blue coming through, some activity coming through from um, those, those uh, compounds, which was actually quite a surprise to us. Um, and uh, again, when we look back at those compounds, there was no um, uh, logical reason as to why those individual compounds um, uh, had carried over. They weren't the most potent. There was no specific chemical structure that, that, that led us to believe there was a reason for it. Um, but we were able to uh, optimize the protocol um, and uh, subsequently clean uh, or starting with the, the, the uh, uh, repeat the original pharmacology play, clean to, to, to get uh, complete removal of those compounds. And in this case, it was the introduction of the uh, pre-spin and micro of solvent that allowed us to remove it. Um, so with um, careful optimization of the protocol, we're able to show that this is actually a very effective way of, of uh, reusing the microtitan plates. We're able to use these uh, now to produce um, a new microtiter plate uh, approximately once every 45 seconds. And uh, within the laboratories here, we've cleaned uh, many different types of plates um, from the polystyrene plates uh, through to uh, optical plates uh, with glass bottoms and, and tested them in several cellular and biochemical assays. So um, I hope from the, the um, examples I've given you there, you can see how we've had several um, uh, successful collaborations working with vendors um, to develop um, infrastructure, develop um, systems that, that are crucial for long-term support of, of high throughput screening. But there's something else which is also um, important for, for high throughput screening and the long-term success, and that's the the service support model. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how the UK Centre is set up. Um, currently, it's in Manchester, and uh, we, we have um, some historic automation here, including the biocells, a dual six, and a, and a, a high res A cell robot, alongside the new automation you saw in the video. Um, which are the, the high-res KUKA systems, we have two of those, and uh, a cart-to-cart -cart system, one of those. We're currently looking at expanding the deployment here uh, to, to further cart-to-cart -cart systems as well. But this is, this is um, uh, one part of what will be the UK centre. On the transition to Cambridge, this will actually become uh, five full high-res KUKA systems, four cart-to-cart -cart systems, and potentially also uh, an automated uh, chemistry system. Uh, DMTA is, is design, design make, test, uh, uh, analyze, and, and is uh, how we would describe our uh, iterative uh, chemistry programs. All of this will be within the UK Centre, alongside uh, the ability to, to run the automation platforms within a, a clean room, supported by TC laboratory, uh, supported by compound management, uh, and uh, assay development and, and manual base. So it'll be quite a complicated, very, very large and complicated um, screening uh, infrastructure. And with that, we're anticipating to be delivering uh, up to 50 screens per year, um, and that may be as many as 50 million wells screened per year, uh, split across our open innovation and AstraZeneca portfolios. We've had to think very carefully about how we would achieve this and, and um, how uh, much infrastructure we would need, and that's been modelled uh, based on the, the infrastructure I've just shown you, um, and based on um, operation throughout the, the day and night uh, during the week. And, and in order to achieve this demand, our uh, modeling indicates that uh, we would need to achieve 78 to 80% utilization of those systems and 90% reliability. That, that reliability of a system is key. If we start a system, 90% uh, means if we start a system, uh, nine times out of 10, it will complete without any um, uh, user interaction or um, um, error. 
Okay, and we know that this is achievable. There's some data here from some of the early uh, biocell systems uh, deployed 10 years ago. Uh, here with close support uh, on-site engineers, um, and, and at the time, what was felt to be the absolute. Uh, absolutely the best way in which we could support these systems. But even so, we found that we would lose uh, 2 to 4% of our data and have to retest that. Um, and that there were many more errors um, that required people to be around in order um, for those plates to be rescued. And, and quite often they were rescuable um, if somebody was there. And um, in addition to that, what, what we observed in this data is that many of the the issues I uh, saw uh, occurred because of human error, and that's the complexity of using these systems. And a lot of what we talked about in terms of the software is about reducing uh, the complexity of using them and reducing that human error. But clearly, we also need uh, a, an engineering and a support um, group uh, to ensure that the new systems can reach this level. And we, we decided to ask two key suppliers, uh, CBRE and uh, High Risk Biosolutions, uh, to consider how they would meet these requirements. And key considerations for us were that high reliability, uh, the future porting of this, this organization from Manchester to Cambridge, um, and the complexity of the third party um, devices that were going to be on these systems. And what they came back with, actually, uh, was really interesting. They came back and said that, that individually, neither of them felt that they were best placed to support this infrastructure. And, and so instead, they proposed um, that they work together in, in a collaboration in order to deliver that. And that's, that's different because uh, uh, if we compare that to what we used to do, uh, and that's shown at the bottom of this slide, the standard AZ model, and um, CBRE uh, are responsible here on site uh, for the whole of site, have engineers across site, and somebody might be working in, in high super screening one day, compound management another, and, and maybe another part of site on another day. Um, and they're responsible for that first fix, for trying to resolve issues, catalog issues, uh, interaction then with um, the external vendors to manage contracts and manage uh, vendor engineers coming in as well to to, to um resolve issues, whereas high res were, were one of those vendors and under warranty or under a support package when notified would come in and, and help resolve it. And what we've been able to do for the first phase here, oops, I've gone backwards, first phase here in uh, Manchester is, is get an enhanced um, support model. So now we have a dedicated um, on-site uh, integrated system engineer, um, so they, he, he only operates uh, with us uh, on site, no, not on anybody else, and is based within the group, so that uh, ease of interaction uh, and, and uh, communication is much better. And we also have uh, an application specialist as well, um, and uh, this helps both with um, training of our users, but also helps uh, the engineering side, because there's somebody there that can work with them to ensure that equipment wants it's been fixed is operating successfully before it's handed back to our scientists. And HiRes's part in this has been that um, they're now on site three days a month for dedicated support beyond their ordinary support package, and they're wor working very closely um, both with AstraZeneca staff and with CBRE to train them to ensure that quality of what we're getting is, is as good as it possibly can be. And on transition to um, Cambridge, we're anticipating that the support model from high res will, will increase and we'll have, as well as on-site um, CBRE support, we'll have uh, on-site high res uh, personnel uh, for engineering, software and applications, um, really driving a close collaboration between these two groups and delivering the best possible um, service to, to both AstraZeneca running our screens, but also our collaborators that will be within this space. And I want to finish in the last few minutes of, of this presentation to give you an example, uh, a couple of screens uh, that have been run on our cart-to-cart -cart systems, uh, the types of screens and, and the reliability that, that we've been able to, to see. 
And the first, the first high throughput screen we ran on these systems actually uh, on on the the cart to cart system was a cell based um, GPCR assay using this DiscoverX technology. And um, this is a technology where we ran uh, the seeding of the uh, cells into the plates offline uh, and incubated them offline before transitioning them onto this screening platform. Uh, once on the platform, uh, an agonist was added. And um, so we were looking for an antagonist in this case uh, in our screening approach. So we added an antagonist, incubated for 90 minutes, added our detection reagent, incubated for a further 90 minutes uh, before reading on our multi-mode reader. And um, so a relatively simple uh, uh, screening platform uh, or, or screening cascade. Um, and uh, this, this saw um, 1.8 million compounds uh, across a 22-day screening uh, campaign. And I'll move on to the, the second uh, screen as well to give you some details on that. Um, this uh, was a more complicated cell imaging campaign, but most of the pre-work in preparation for this assay was done offline and was done manually. So uh, the, the addition of, of antibodies and uh, compounds and washing was all done uh, offline. Um, but there was still a, a bottleneck with the ability to read these plates on the cell insight. Hence, they were transferred onto the cart-to-cart -cart system uh, in order to maximize um, our use of those systems. And on this, in this case, it's a workflow that represents um, the storage of our plates in a, in a steri store and transfer to uh, storage at room temperature on the cart, uh, reading, and then uh, uh, taking back into a, a steri store for, for long-term storage. And what we found with this assay is that um, by doing this, we're able to dramatically increase the number of plates that we could generate and store. So instead of just having the, the um, 48 plates on the cart, we can now use the Steri store to um, store plates and run uh, a long time into the weekend. Um, and uh, uh, run into the weekend without people needing to come in and reload. Um, the four degree storage uh, followed by incubation at room temperature was critical for this assay because it improves the signal um, by moving it to, to room temperature uh, and allows us to, to only have it at room temperature for the period that we need it. So there's no long term uh, degradation of um, the sample by leaving it at four degrees. And, uh, uh, Finally, by not having large numbers of plates out on the platform, um, because of the way we're moving them to, to and from cold storage, the risk should something go wrong is also uh, much smaller. And um, finally, uh, the, 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 the um, proof of the pudding here is uh, across these two assays, uh, really low failure rates achieved. Um, and what we found is we've actually completely eliminated human error on these platforms, which is which is a great um, success. For, for the first HTS, um, the DiscoverX um, GPCR assay, uh, we did lose 14 of um, uh, 1,500 plates, and that was a, a dispense error. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, that's unavoidable. Sometimes those things do happen. Um, we did have occasion where there was um, a failure in um, one of the pieces of software for the for the plate reader. Um, 50 plates failed to read, um, but because of the nature of the assay, we were able to restart. We didn't lose those. And that bug in the, the software is now being rectified, so that won't occur again. And uh, the second uh, screen here, uh, the more complex cell screen, again, a very low uh, loss rate due to that improved storage. Um, nine screening runs uh, were completed um, on the, the system, uh, many of those out of hours or over the weekend, and we did only lose one of 500 plates, and that was due to uh, uh, an error on the, the cell insight. Uh, again, we believe that we can avoid this in the future. There were, there were two other separate automation errors uh, around process flow and data storage. Um, 
that did delayed flights and meant they, meant they weren't read when they were supposed to. But again, due to the cold storage, we were able to reread those so they weren't actually lost. So the quality of, of what we've got here um, in reduction of, of uh, rework and elimination of failure is, is very, very high. And uh, I want to finish the presentation, actually, um, simply by acknowledging um, the team. Uh, this is a, a photograph of my team, the high-throughput screening group at AstraZeneca on uh, one of our um, away days uh, last year. And a uh, really successful day. Everybody's in, in, enjoyed themselves there. Um, but I actually really enjoy doing what we do, um, working with the vendors, uh, collaborating uh, within and outside of AstraZeneca to deliver really what, what is a, a high quality infrastructure and, and success to projects. And with that, um, I, I will finish and, and take any questions. Thank you, Mark, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen, click the Send button, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, are there any limitations on the types of projects that can be proposed through the Open Innovation Portal? Uh, okay, thanks. Um, the, there are um, no limitations on proposals, although um, the uh, projects that AstraZeneca would select to advance are projects that align with the, the key disease areas um, that, that uh, we work in. So the information is, is within the portal on those, and they broadly align to uh, respiratory and inflammation, um, oncology, uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. And um, we have some interest, uh, opportunistic interest as well around uh, neuroscience. Um, the, the individual uh, collaborations that we have with the Medical Research Council um, are more open. They can bring in any um, disease area that they feel is valid for them to support. Um, and the Cancer Research UK collaborations are, are limited to, to the oncology space. Great, thank you. Another question we have here asks, how do you go about starting a collaboration with a vendor to develop new equipment? Um, I think somewhat it depends on the um, type of equipment. And, and in the um, uh, collaborations that I've spoken about, I mean, clearly with the, the high throughput screening um, robotics, um, we looked at the vendors um, that were active in that space and made some um, uh, assessment of, of the equipment that uh, they had and then we approached them with okay we, we like what you've done here uh, but we would really like to go somewhere else with it and that conversation at that point is, is really interesting most of the vendors actually are, or, or all of the vendors I've approached actually are really open to um, those types of conversation and um, effectively it helps them with, with their product development um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think it's just a case of approaching with open question and, and really being clear about the design specification that, that you need. Um, and uh, the, the vendors tend to be open to that. Okay, we have time for one more question. And this one asks, do you think the reliability of systems will get worse over time? Um, <clears throat> So uh, at the new systems, um, I think at the moment, I mean, I, I've shown you some uh, data where there's been um, some issues with uh, bugs in software or, or things that we've been able to um, iron out as we've learned about them. I think that's always the way with new systems. Um, and, and I think um, certainly short term, I'd expect that reliability actually to get a little bit better. Um, I think the deployment of um, the service infrastructure that, that I've spoken about um, uh, should guarantee that 
that we uh, reach those really high levels of, of um, reliability um, and that we maintain them for, for a really long time. Um, so I guess eventually with any any system, uh, it, it may well wear out, but I think with what we've put in place, we've got every chance of improving from where we are and maintaining that for a very long time. I would like to once again thank Mark Wigglesworth for his presentation. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.